All right, guys, I think we can kick it off now and the other people can join in as uh, they connect with us. So welcome to our first Python Karachi uh, and Elastic Meetup um, for, I think this year, um, we tried doing this in um, March, I think, and that was right before the COVID situation happened. So um, as everyone is uh, doing uh, meetups online, so we thought, you know, might as well do this online as well. So we have uh, three awesome talks for you today. And uh, I'll kick off with uh, an introduction of what is Python Karachi, and then um, hand over to Janae to, to talk a little bit about the Elastic uh, community as well. Uh, and then we'll continue on with our talks. So uh, Python Karachi came, in, came to being about a year and a half ago. Uh, and this was something uh, I started uh, and me and a bunch of other friends here in Karachi, we thought that the space was missing. There are a lot of people who wanted to learn Python, learn things about Python, but there wasn't a single platform where everyone in this place in, in Karachi was actually just talking about it. Um, there were no meetups happening and stuff like that. So uh, Python Karachi's core aim has been to um, set up meetups and uh, we have a group on uh, Facebook where we have our discussions, we share interesting things, links, tutorials, things like that. So uh, if you are interested in learning more about Python, you can always reach out in the group or to me directly and I'm happy to guide anyone over here. Um, for those who missed it, last end of last year, we also had our first uh, PyCon conference in Karachi, uh, PyCon Pakistan uh, 2019. Um, it went very well. We had over 500 people there. Uh, we had some international speakers as well. Um, not planning to do it this year, just again because of the situation, but uh, we'll see how this wraps up and then maybe next year we'll definitely try again. Um, so this was it. For from Python Karachi side, I'm gonna hand it over quickly to uh, Janae to uh, tell us a bit about uh, Elastic uh, Meetup Group as well. Hello everyone, Asalaamu Alaikum. So uh, just a brief introduction about Elastic community, how it evolved. So I think uh, the first Elastic Meetup was held in Lahore uh, in around 2017 time, but in Karachi, it was held in September. And that was the time we, we thought about uh, having a community uh, in Karachi where we can actually uh, together learn and uh, share whatever cool stuff we have been working with, uh, the, uh, with, with, with whatever tools Elastic has to offer. And so uh, the first meetup, in-person meetup was held in September. And then we had a total of two in-person meetups. One was at Let's Semantic, the other one was at Folio 3. And then uh, in this particular, you can say, uh, meetup, it was originally planned to be uh, an, an in-person back in uh, March. But uh, due to, again, COVID, we have to uh, actually shift it to the uh, the remote ones. So overall, uh, the primary purpose is, uh, again, learning uh, the newer technologies and sharing, with, sharing it with the different people around so that, again, we have some, some collaborated effort going on that particular front as well. So uh, yeah, we are looking forward to have more such events uh, in the future. And uh, after the uh, event, please feel free to uh, join our Facebook pages, both the Python Karachi and uh, Elastic Stack Group Pakistan as well, and do share your valuable feedback on those particular uh, platforms. Uh, also, uh, the the recordings of these sessions will be shared, uh, and I think in, in next couple of days those will be uh, shared on the respective uh, community pages. So, yep, that that's it from my side. Uh, back to you, Mashud. Uh, thanks, Junaid. Um, so we're going to dive right into our talks for today. And we're going to start with uh, an, uh, a talk on Elasticsearch first. Um, and then we'll have two more talks uh, on Python. 
So I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Vasim Asif from Kabi Technologies to share about uh, using ELK for data processing. Uh, over to you, Vasim. Thank you, Vasim. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, hey, guys. Okay, so my name is uh, Vasim. Let me actually share my screen as well. So today we're going to talk about how we can use Elasticsearch for uh, data processing and uh, and what features we can use. So because data processing and data uh, science is the area which is growing and need of processing the raw data into very structured format, then able to search on it, able to uh, represent graphical representation of the visualization of the data is becoming very uh, handy for uh, data science. So Elastic Stack is a great tool to uh, actually all do all this. Let me start with like uh, agenda. Okay, let me start with my introduction as well. I'm uh, as I said Vaseem, my name is Vaseem Elastic. I'm Elastic Stack certified engineer. I have about five plus years I've been working with Elastic Stack, uh, which was known to be Elk Stack. Uh, I have, uh, before that I have been working, actually I'm working uh, still with solar. So six plus years experience with solar and nine plus years experience with full tech searching, which using Swing Search, Solar, and then Elastic Search. So in total, I have about 10 years experience dealing with full tech searching. Anyway. So at the moment, I am founder at Covey Technologies. At Covey Technologies, we focus very uh, specifically on Elastic Stack and full tech search related uh, and data processing, data visualization kind of projects. Uh, and uh, we are located in Karachi. Then uh, before that, I was architect at Folio3, which is also a renowned software house for Pakistan. Before that, I've been uh, working as product manager at TradeKey, which was a B2B portal. And uh, you can view my LinkedIn profile if anyone in, is interested. So uh, today, what we're going to see is that why do we need Elastic Stack? Then an overview of Elastic Search. Elastic Stack, actually. Then a detailed overview of Elastic Search, Kivana, Logstash. So how we actually uh, use this into uh, data processing, data visualization, searching, structuring, or manipulation, or uh, anything else. So as you guys know that data science is, have a very specific uh, process. Like first part is to obtain the data because data can exists in many different formats. It can be a simple file, it can be a uh, API, it can be an, uh, it can be a, a web page, it can be HTML, any, any sort of data which we need to interact with and uh, we need to use. And obviously logic, next logical step of it's to scrape the data uh, and uh, clean the data and structurize the data. That is the area, like these two areas are the basics of Elastic Stack. And then the, there is explore model where you look into data, you uh, see what kind of data is available, what kind of anomalies we are having and what kind of uh, issues we are facing with data structure. And in further then, then we create models based on uh, the data, same data and uh, structured data. And then we do a lot of machine learning jobs. We can use it in machine learning or uh, we can use it to generate automatic alerts. We can use it to, uh, uh, we can use it to analyze the situation without human intervention required. And then obviously the driving results from that data interpretation. So all these areas are very much covered by, actually this is Elastic Stack is the best tool to uh, cover all these tools in one signified one uh, what we can is a one shop solution for all these issues okay so in normal uh, life cycle we get data something like this uh, like a lot of logs coming in from somewhere like if you are system analyst or you are your system administrator or your security uh, administrator of the network you will see data generated like this on servers. 
you must you, you, many of you already very familiar on it and with the like we are now we are having a more and more uh, uh, more and more uh, data sources more and more servers cloud servers not only servers applications generate a lot of uh, data so it's only making our life worse which is to uh, like how many screens we can look at and you need uh, you see at this speed you cannot even guess what is going on so what is my system under attack is my what's going on my system is somebody requesting a specific page or like there's so many use cases where we uh, where we see a lot of data coming in and we need to make sense of that data so in this particular uh, session i'll be discussing a case where we had very similar situation like a lot of data was being generated from system servers windows linux everything firewalls and uh, hundreds of devices which were very telco specific so how did we use to use elastic stack to actually make that data very meaningful and extract meaningful information make it searchable visualization of the data and things like that so in this you will see like how from raw text we how we get it to the end result of the data visualization modeling etc i'm a bit far but if you need any question in between you need to ask you can ask or if you don't get any point you can interrupt me and let me know okay so in this scenario what we had was like there was log logs and logs were having all kind of useful data like which user logged in from which ip which user is accessing which server um, is that login failing is that password change the password incorrect like a lot of things which are very useful for the security aspect and the uh, other information and the volume was very uh, much a concern because about daily 40 50 gb of logs were being generated and this i said the kids said that they can send sorry so security is a big concern as well uh, because they wanted the, the system admins like to know like who is accessing what machine and what resources and then obviously reporting visualization and automatic alerting was uh, required by them so elastic stack ha has all the tools for to achieve all these needs and uh, see if we can distribute elastic stack into different areas like elastic itself offers uh, a packaged packaged solutions as well for example logging metrics application performance monitoring uptime security analytics application search sites search enterprise search and all these managed cloud hosted or or you can download as well and you can try on you can self manage those so these are the package solutions which are uh, which we can have a major distribution then if we go into elastic stack then you will see that we have beats a lot of beats beats is a tool to collect data uh, like if exam for example we are talking about logs so it has winlog beat which is installed on windows and it uh, processes the uh, windows logs and send it to elastic stack for further processing and uh, visualization and elast then uh, there are a lot of beats so any kind of uh, data you want to see uh, you want to get it will help you the, the so the first part which is obtain is fully covered by beats and some part of is also by log stash Logstash is a tool which is used for incoming data processing. For example, uh, we are collecting the data from syslog, from files, etc., and then we want to perform additional uh, operations on that data before we store it into uh, Elasticsearch. So there's a lot of things which can be done. Like for example, if we are getting an IP in the our web server logs, we can get the actual location of that ip from log stash during the enrichment process in the log stash so we can produce easily very interactive uh, location based map of the 
from where our users are requesting. This is very useful in the web uh, applications mostly. And there are a lot of other implementations as well. And then, so this these two parts are like beats and log stash. They, these are part of ingest, like we are ingesting the data from many different sources. And there are so many sources which you can use uh, with beats and log stash. So uh, doesn't matter if it is Windows or Linux or is it files, you need to get something from FTP, you need to get something from API or anything. So do explore these two and you'll see how much uh, how much life it can make very it can make your life very easy then elasticsearch as you all know um, you may know that elasticsearch is the core of the elastic stack it's a called heart of the elastic stack we will go into big details on elasticsearch and kibana later on so just to give you an overview like elasticsearch is kind of storage you can say database you can say uh, storage anal analysis and search engine and then we have kibana which is all about visualization management of the elastic stack and everything so this is your interface for uh, managing visualization and managing the uh, stack itself and then they're like you can deploy it on your own you can deploy it on elastic stack or there are other services available as well so it's complete solution here like you it's so open source and uh, very useful for the community. So uh, this this was the end result. What we uh, you see the screens you saw for the logs we had very much similar, and this is the end result we produced with the Elastic Stack. So uh, the visualization uh, most most visualization you are seeing on this this screen are generated by uh, Elastic Stack like Kibana, and uh, I'll go into a bit more details, like how we uh, did that. So here, so you can see like any analyst can have a look and see how many requests are coming on in which are ports are being used, which locations are the chart on the top right is the, uh, you'll see a location chart so it's showing from where we are getting the traffic. Uh, what's the load on the servers? The, the middle bottom screen is showing the load on the servers everything. So this is the end result of how, how Elastic Stack actually got the logs and then, then what was the end result which was produced. So uh, give me an, uh, like I've covered most of these uh, features, but you see like basic feature is storage, searching and full text search, then analytics and visualizations uh, with using Kibana. Machine learning is a uh, part of Elastic Stack. Uh, it's with required license, but is very useful. And stack management, of which I mentioned, like it's from Kibana. It, it, Kibana has built-in tools for all the stock stack management. Like when you have deployed a lot of Elastic Search machines or uh, Elastic Stack machines, so it's very becomes very easy to manage those. Scalability, it's from ground up. It's very scalable. You just keep adding machines, and you'll just uh, scale it. Security is like very basic feature and available by default. So uh, it's very secure. Like you can you can be sure that your data is secured. In role based access and everything is available. Stack monitoring and <laughs> alerting is available all the time. And data ingestion is the like which I where I mentioned the beats and the uh, log stash. Data ingestion from all of the like almost any any source. You need to query the database, you need to uh, get from file or anything, you can do it. The reporting, interactive <clears throat> maps, I mentioned. And the good thing about Elastic Stack is that their APIs are available in, uh, they, they use REST API for everything. <laughs> like you can manage every aspect of the Elastic Stack from the REST APIs. And like insertion of data, deletion of data, uh, curing of data, console, like um, like you need to add, remove node, or you need to change settings on the index and everything. So you can do it from API. So you don't, you're not depending on any one tool. And it supports a lot of database data sources, a lot of data transformation. The IP example, IP to location example is just one of those. So if you explore, it will allow, it will give you all 
all tools and kits which you can use for process any kind of data. Then it has application monitoring uh, for like it. It can give you code level performance metrics, uh, like what what's going on in your code. Then we have uptime monitoring. Then we have security information and event management, seam uh, monitoring, infrastructure monitoring. So you just want to see which of your machines are having load. What is the CPU usage? What is the and then we have uh, uh, Elastic Stack support is also available with the license version. And uh, so people, so many people ask like, what's free with the Elastic Stack and what is not? So I just jot down a small list. So uh, uh, so free stuff. There is a lot of free stuff with Elastic Stack. Full text searching is by default free. Data ingestion is free. Data sources, any kind of data source is free. Like in, is is in available in the free license. Data transformation, visualization, application performance monitoring agents, infrastructure agents, uptime, and it's not yet like scalability is like free. You can add as many machine as you want. Uh, clustering and high availability is default feature of Elastic Stack. Autom automatic data rebalancing, like if if you had only one machine and now you have ended up uh, having one terabyte data on that machine and you just add an, another machine and it will rebalance your data, like it will split data between the uh, two nodes and all available nodes uh, as we add more nodes. So it's all free. Cross, cross cluster search is available in the search. There is an also like cross cluster application, like you want to machine manage multiple cluster in multiple geo location. So replication is required license, but license is also a very cheap as compared to other alternatives. Machine learning, see basic data visualization is, visualizer is free, which is itself is very, very good tool. Uh, like if you familiar with data, you you know, whenever we get the data, we need to explore know, like what interested, interesting aspects are available with the data. So data visualizer help you explore your data, like what we have, what from where to start with. And then we, uh, there are some uh, features which require subscription. So that's not part of the discussion today. So we'll skip, just skip through. As I mentioned, like we'll go a bit detail in Elastic Search itself. So as I mentioned, it's called heart of the Elastic Stack. All the storage is done in Elastic Stack. It's very scalable. It has RESTful APIs for all the aspects, even managing nodes, removing node, adding node up, everything. Then it's very fast. You will not find any tool which is which can handle this much of data at this pace. Uh, like, there are so many tools available other than Elastic Sci, but you'll find it best of the breed. It provides all the analytic abilities. Uh, like I'll share some screens of uh, Kibana. You'll see uh, the screens which I showed you in previous slides. So you can, you can see that how many, like we are looking at so many different aspects of the data and we can drill down, we can, uh, do full charts, dashboards, and a lot of charts uh, based on Elastic Stack. Then uh, it's like log monitoring, it has maps integration, security analytics integration, infrastructure monitoring. There's a lot of things which we can do with Elastic Search itself. And good thing is that all the components, which is Elastic Search, which is log stash, beats, all these use can be used independently. Like to use Elasticsearch, you don't need to install Logstash. You don't need to know the uh, Logstash. So you can just start with uh, Elasticsearch and uh, Kibana. So, so uh, this is one of the screens of uh, our implementation. You will see this is the monitoring screen of uh, Elasticsearch. So you can see, I would just wanted to give you overview of like scale it can, uh, do and it can do a lot more than this as well. So for example, in this, we had eight nodes. Eight nodes mean like we have eight Elasticsearch machines. And we were, at that time, we were hosting 4.1 billion documents and which was 3.8 terabyte of data. Like if you are, if you have tried any similar tools in the past, 
you'll see like 3.8 terabyte data is not a uh, it's not a small deal so and this was screen for very initial i can tell you like it's more than 12 billion documents at the moment in, in the same cluster this was initial uh, uh, initial stages of the project so it had 4 billion otherwise now it's about 12 billion at least i can remember and then there is kivana which is your interface with elastic search like it's a visual interface with and if you explore kibana you will see so many kind of visualizations which are more many uh, like which are day to day need of the any person who is working with data any person who is work, working with data sciences or ex, just exploring data sciences so if you go to and develop these kind of visualization by yourself by custom implementation it's going to take years but kibana has made all these visualization very easily available freely available actually and you can do a lot of uh, analysis and a lot of charts custom charts in the kibana so and kibana is also interface to manage elastic etc so it's very useful to like people you just in the install elastic size and then kibana you'll you just log into kibana and you'll start seeing like uh, what's happening in the elastic search and things like that so so this is your interface it also hosts the interface for machine learning graphs networks uh, location based and location based maps uh, you can see in the slides as well so kibana is like very and you can create dashboards you can download those dashboards you can share those dashboards and so many things you can do with uh, kibana this is another example of visualization so you'll see a lot of lot of visualization available by default in kibana and you can do a lot by yourself as well and this also i wanted to demonstrate like kibana is not just boring charts so you can do a lot of custom uh, a lot of custom dashboard development so this is a typical e-commerce uh, company which is selling products in many different categories so this is very interactive dashboard for for the management like okay we have 11 percent accessories products we have uh, 25 percent clothing what people are actually buying how many women are buying 38 percent women and of are the total customers of the total customer 62 percent men are buying our products what is the revenue what is the sales etc so this is example dashboard for uh, so this is called canvas so you can do a lot of things with uh, kibana and this is another example so you can design on your own if you don't like kibana <laughs> visualization which is very hard to uh, ignore so you can do at your own as well okay um, so the first remember the first part where is obtain and then the cleansing scrubbing of data so log stash is uh, is the right tool to do it as i mentioned beats beats uh, like it offers you data ingestion from so many sources that i'm insisting on so many sources like there's so many like even i have not explored many of those for example s3 file api syslog database sqs any queue uh management services or anything you like then you can do <laughs> transformation of the data in enrichment of the data which is very critical part of the uh, data sciences and data processing uh, you can do a lot of regular expressions date processing key value processing htm http json uh, comma separated values there are a lot of enrichment you can uh, transform the data then enrich the data into so many things and then you can ship that data to anywhere not you you're not required to ship your data into elastic search anyway you can put it in some other database you can send it to email you can send it to your web service tcps you can send to solar you can send to redis redmine which is ticketing tool there's so many things where you can do it with kibana so it's very scalable it's very fast like i'll show you some screens for kibana like it has been running for many many months and 
we didn't need to interrupt it at all like it's so uh, consistent it has persistent queue uh, so you don't lose the data uh, which is coming in due to interruptions and then it has monitoring of, of its own so you can uh, know what's uh, going on in kibana so this is a brief overview of uh, like how the elastic stack looks in the production or looks in the use so what we do is that we use beats which are like file beat metric beat file beat is to read from file metric beat is from read from systems uh, then packet beat is to for network hard beat is to monitor the uptime function beat is for lambda function etc audit beat is to scan the systems and look for any changes in the critical file system etc so we can use all kind of beats to ship data to logstash and then logstash to elastic search elastic search to so many other services like you can you use it in the kibana or you can use it with any application which you like uh, any programming language which you like and uh, then we don't need to bind we are not bound to use beats so we can use we can connect logstash directly with our databases web apis sensors social media api etc and then we can add obviously buffering in kafka redis or so many messaging queues etc and uh, this is just to show you the scale of the uh, logstash so with the logstash we were doing about uh, these are like 4500 events per second which is very large as compared to uh, most of the implementations and uh, this we were using doing with only five nodes and uh, using very little memory and uh, very little resources and this is the uh, stack monitoring of that implementation so you'll see the uh, you see logstash uptime so our logstash have been uptime for two months and in two months it process about 13.5 billion events uh, which were coming in and it was passing to elastic search after some processing and uh, this elastic search you can see with eight seven nodes actually we have 13 billion uh, documents or records or logs uh, in that cluster so it's very very scalable it's very easy to get start this is another screen for uh the same implementation uh, you can see like uh, events how what is the speed of events coming in this is for one log stash node and uh, how much cpu utilization you see cpu is very normal range so we can use a lot of like even if it is 3000 4000 per second so single node is enough to handle a lot of load this is another screen i just wanted to give you scale because data processing scale is scale matters a lot uh, so many people uh, like whenever you are selecting a tool you should be very sure of your scale how much data it can handle so this is another example of the same log stash pipelines so you will see like 2000 events per second or 2000 more than 2000 actually on average uh enrichment uh, i think we don't we don't need to go into much detail of enrichment like if you explore you'll uh there are a lot of tutorials available from elastic a lot of uh available so you can <coughs> look into <coughs> uh more details on this these are some beats which i mentioned so you can look into beats to collect data from so many different sources so you don't need to write your own uh coding to actually get the data this is another implementation of uh, elastic stack which is for security and information event management system and uh, elastic stack comes it with by default so you can use it you can secure your infrastructure monitoring your infrastructure with uh, this system and with all free uh this one i'll skip and uh, at the end i'll just give you like what we what kavi technologies is at so at at kavi technologies we implement like we have been working with elastic stack for very beginning since very beginning of it and uh, and we are really impressed so now we nowadays we do most of the implementation using elastic stack so uh, there are so many cases that other tools can fit in but elastic stack is like uh, give us all the flexibility 
So we are doing a lot of elastic stack implementation, consultancy for the same, and elastic search, like performance and scalability optimization. There are a lot of lot of users who are using elastic search only for searching. So relevance tuning uh, is something that is very much needed. So we are doing that. We are like based in Karachi, Pakistan, uh, but we have a global customer base uh, uh, from all over the world. And uh, I'm sorry I rushed too fast because uh, <laughs> I had to run somewhere. That is why I requested uh, to schedule my talk. Uh, but I think it would make more sense if I have done it at the end, but I could not, I'm sorry about that. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, please ask. And uh, like all the graphics I use from Elastic Stack. So thank you, Elastic Stack. <laughs> thank you. So you can ask me any question. Bye. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Simbai, for a lovely presentation. Um, so we have a question in the comments. Uh, and that is, uh, if we don't need any log transformations, can we skip out log stash components as well? Uh, or yes, absolutely. Uh, you can directly send to Elasticsearch. Even the beats, there's so many beats which support uh, they, they, they can send to elastic, uh, elastic search directly. So you don't need to involve the log stash at all. And, uh, they are like, there are both option. So you can skip it. Awesome. Um, I, I'm, I'm also a little bit curious. So we've talked about that. There's a subscription for elastic search. Could you also share, uh, usually, what is the cost of the subscription uh, for a small medium business if they wanted to get something that was uh, fully functional? Uh, see, uh, the costing is a bit com uh, like because it depends on industry, depends on region, depends on uh, the company which is equal looking for that license. But it's fairly, it's very fair. Like if we compare it with other alternates, for example. Curidar or uh, other security products, other logging products, it's very competitive. And uh, we are in like, uh, it's worth mentioning that, that we are partner, uh, reseller partner for Elasticsearch in this region, like Pakistan, India, uh, Asian, Asia Pacific and Japan region. And also like we can deal with Middle East, et cetera. So if you guys, any of you need uh, any further details on costing or you want to estimate like your implementation, uh, you can feel free to reach me. Like costing is dynamic, it's not very fixed. So I cannot comment on that. But it's very fair. So you will, it's worth. All right, perfect. Uh, yeah, I, we, I don't see any other questions, uh, at least in the chat. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions? Uh, you can just raise their hands. We can bring them in. Looks like there, there are no more questions. Awesome. Uh, awesome. That, that was it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Haseem Bhai. Thank you very so much. I'll, I'll be running away. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much for uh, gathering and arranging. And so it's good to connect with the community. Awesome. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Bye. Um, all right. So um, next up, uh, I think I'm going to go ahead with my talk on Django with GraphQL. Let me just uh, share my screen. All right, um, I hope you guys can see my screen. Um, if not, just uh, send a shout out. Um, so um, I'm gonna be talking today about, uh, so this is a Python specific talk and we're gonna be talking about two very popular concepts, Django and GraphQL. 
Uh, I'm assuming you've already know Django uh, since if you are uh, part of the, the program, but in case if you're new, uh, worth checking out. Uh, so Django is, is a really awesome uh, batteries included framework in, in Python. Uh, and it's something that we're using a lot. So in this talk, we'll see how we can use GraphQL with Django, how GraphQL works in the Python space in general on a high level view. And then uh, we'll wrap it up with some issues that I saw uh, with using GraphQL in Python and uh, just my general thoughts uh, overall on that. So um, my name is Mashoud and I work as the CTO at a startup called Sustetica.pk. Um, we are working as the uh, e-commerce travel platform for Pakistan. Um, so right now we're doing flights and hotels, but uh, hopefully in the coming months, we'll be doing a lot more cool stuff like Omra, buses, trains, and whatnot. So um, we are primarily powered by using Python. Uh, a lot of our services are in Django as well. And uh, our front end is mostly React. Um, I'm also something called uh, Google Developer Expert for Web and Angular. Google Developer Expert is a program from Google that uh, essentially uh, you get this badge uh, if you're very active in the community and you're sharing a lot of stuff like I do. Um, if you like to know more about uh, the GDE program and more, so I also kind of run this podcast. I started this recently a few weeks ago. And uh, over here you can uh, find out a little bit more about things that interest me, different tech topics, including the GDE program. So uh, getting into the uh, topic at hand today. Let's start with a quick introduction of what is GraphQL, and then we'll, we'll dive into um, how do we use it with Django. So uh, GraphQL was uh, something that was released by Facebook, and this happened all the way back in 2015. The basic premise of GraphQL was that Facebook was trying to fetch data and uh, what they realized was that they were passing back to the client a lot of redundant data over their APIs. So they wanted a flexible way to query data and manage their APIs. And from, from their perspective, REST just wasn't cutting it. So the whole, whole protocol was essentially designed and implemented by Facebook. Uh, it was open sourced and then later transferred over to Linux Foundation so that uh, Facebook since it doesn't control it anymore. Now it is an independent uh, platform that is growing on its own. The cool part about GraphQL is that all of your work happens on a, on a single endpoint. So your GraphQL receives all the requests on this one endpoint, uh, unlike what we are normally used to, and it processes all of these requests uh, in a specific manner, and we'll talk about that in a bit. So, uh, if you want to get the highest level view, uh, so GraphQL is considered to be a query and manipulation language. So that means that it is not a database, so it does not store data, it only processes the data. And more specifically, it processes the queries. So it, we define what kind of data we have, and then we're able to query that data in a very flexible manner. And it also has something called mutations that allows us to change that data in a very specific way. Uh, and my favorite thing about GraphQL is the built-in type system it has. And type safety is something that we have, I mean, personally, I think have struggled with a lot over the last several years with REST because um, on the back end, we're building something, we create models, we create a lot of code, uh, and then on the front end, the, the developers take some sort of feedback from, from the back end developers and they create their own models and everything else. And a lot of the time there is a, a mismatch of uh, what the properties hold, uh, what their types are, what their names are. And then when they try integrating at the end of the day, that's where all the clashes happen. So uh, with the, with the built-in type system, you can ensure that whatever's on the back end is definitely the same on the front end because uh, the type safety otherwise will not work. So, so this is something that's very useful uh, that's part of GraphQL. 
So we talked about types and the types of GraphQL are derived from what's called a GraphQL schema. On the right, you can see what a schema looks like. We essentially define what we call types. And over here, I've defined a very simple type called character. This is a movie character. And I have defined two properties on that. One is a name, which is of type string. And the other one is appears in, which is a, an array of episodes. Um, one important thing to add here is the exclamation mark, the bang at the end, which implies that this is a required uh, attribute. So you can obviously have optional attributes and adding that bang kind of enforces, okay, this needs to be configured when we, we create this object. So this is part of the validation uh, of the schema. Now, the cool part about uh, the query, which we're gonna talk about on the next slide is that, so we don't have to return all the properties here. So, uh, and that's where the, the typing part comes in, right? So we, once we've defined all the options here, once we start querying it, we can choose which ones we want. So if we just want the name, we can get the name back over here. So if you look at the query, the GraphQL query is, <clears throat> so you have an example on the side, um, on the right side, and it's, um, <clears throat> it looks very much like JSON, but it's not JSON. Um, so over here, we're querying a hero object uh, with a name and a height. So uh, we could have way more properties on this, but we're just fetching these two properties because these are the two ones we need. And this is part of the power that GraphQL has. And right now we're obviously fetching one model, but we could easily fetch uh, multiple models and even sub models. So if you, the hero, we wanted uh, the hero's episode, so we could ask for the episodes and then inside episodes, we could just ask for the name of the episode or just the ID of the episode. Uh, or any other information that we wanted, right? So this is essentially what the crust of GraphQL is. Uh, it's, the, it's a very powerful query engine that allows you to query in an exact way you want. And it obviously supports all sort of so sorting and filtering and get the first one or the last one or whatever in however form you want, right? The final concept is GraphQL mutations. And uh, mutation we use to modify the data in any way, be it creating data, updating data, or deleting it. So mutations uh, here is a very rough example again, where we are trying to create a review for an episode and we simply call in the create review mutation and we pass in the, the episode itself and the review and on the way back when it's created, I want specific information from the response. And in this case, I'm asking for the stars in the commentary. So uh, on, on the example below, the JSON that we're sending, we're sending the EP, that's the episode, as the Jedi, and the review as the object that's required. And then on the way back, it re responds with the create review, uh, that's the mutation name, and then the information that we asked for, that's the stars and commentary, right? And now this create review is actually implemented on the backend side. So while it's called create review, it could be doing anything. It doesn't actually need to create a review. It could be doing five other things as well. So that, that, that really depends on the implementation on the um, uh, backend side of things. But from a front end perspective, this is a descriptive name. So kind of gives you a sense of what it's gonna do. One other cool thing is um, how errors are structured in GraphQL. So if there is any issue in the API, like in this case, in this example, there is an authentication issue, then we have two attributes on the top level. One is data, and that returns all the data that we've asked for. And the other one is an errors, and that's an array. And if there are any errors, then we'll simply get this array felt in. And now, important thing over here is that you will always get a response of uh, status code of 200 from the GraphQL request. So that's no longer something that we check on the GraphQL side of things. And um, we're always looking at the errors array and trying to figure out what kind of error has happened. 
so that we can then show the appropriate message to our front end. So now that we have an idea of what GraphQL is, I just want to pitch it against uh, how we build APIs today, and that's REST APIs, and just try to give, get a sense of what are we doing differently, which should be obvious now, but just as a, as a summary. So in, in the REST world, when we're creating a CRUD API, we're talking about uh, creating uh, get calls and then get detail calls and then uh, delete, update, so for each model, we go ahead and implement all of these APIs. So we have a structure in place that kind of helps a lot and that kind of helps us uh, get a direction. But at the end of the day, um, it's still very hard, especially when it comes to creating those very specific functions, very specific operations, which are custom on that model. So then you start going into this, um, this place where you have all of these different URLs and you have no idea what they're called and how to call them. So if you compare that to GraphQL, single endpoint, you can essentially request the schema on that endpoint. And if you're using one of the playgrounds that GraphQL provides, then you'll automatically immediately see all the models that are available on the back end. What are the types? What are the operations? What are the queries they support? What are the mutations they support? What mutations? against the type system. So what is each mutation asking for? So within a few seconds, you have access to all of that data. And this is the main advantage of having a, a type system. Um, the second advantage, which is also very obvious, is that in um, when we build uh, the REST APIs, we also have to add validation in our serializers because uh, we have to check if the inputs coming in, do they match the expectations of the model. Um, and very much so uh, in GraphQL, we, this is kind of built in because you have to find the types. It will check and validate the types for you. And if it's not the same, it will simply uh, return that as an error and let you know that, hey, you've messed up your, your type there. Um, I've also mentioned in, in the previous uh, slide that errors are slightly handled differently. We don't have any HTTP status codes. So that's a different way of doing things. Um, and that kind of gives you a, a contrast of how are we dealing. So in terms of implementation, you're not just looking to create more APIs. We're, we're just looking at defining the schema. That's the main big difference that uh, is coming in when we're comparing the GraphQL with, with REST. So if we talk about uh, using GraphQL in Python. This has been around for a little while and you have several libraries out there. So Graphene is the most popular one. Um, Ariadne, uh, I think that's what it's called, is uh, one of the newer contenders and it's a lot more up to date and it's, uh, it's meant to be better and, and when, especially when it comes to things like subscriptions. So uh, you have all of these libraries that are out there and I've gone ahead and used Graphene because one, it had the most documentation and it integrates with Django very well. So it's, and we'll see in a few minutes how, uh, how seamless it is when it comes to using GraphQL with, with Django. So um, the good thing about Graphene is it maintains the same approach uh, of uh, the declarative class-based approach of, uh, uh, that is similar to Django. So effectively, whenever I'm trying to create a schema, instead of creating that JSON that, uh, objects or those JavaScript-like objects for, for my schema, I will simply declare Python classes. And uh, one of my favorite features in this is that I can actually just give it my model and it will automatically configure the whole uh, object for me, so type object for me. And additionally, and we'll see that in a minute, is I can also control uh, using the property which properties I want to include or not, right? So there's a lot of flexibility and at the same time, it's very minimal. So you can just get started super fast and start using it and then expand it as, as you get along. So let's see. and how the code looks like. Uh, so here we're gonna start off with a very simple Django model. Um, I, everyone's built one of these. 
Um, so we built a very simple company model with two properties, name and is enable. And um, I've defined their types uh, as I do in Python and Django. Um, the next thing is to define the schema. And in the schema, we have all the three things. We have the, the model uh, types, we have the queries, and we have the mutation. So over here, we are defining the model type. And uh, Graphene has this special object called Django object type, which essentially takes the model as the class in the meta. And underneath, in, within the meta, you can also define another property here that will uh, take the, the attributes that you want to expose to, to GraphQL. And this is especially useful if you have like a, a model which has some internal properties that you're storing, maybe some states of different things that you don't want to expose to the, the front end. Um, most important thing here to understand is that when you're exposing your schema to the public, then obviously anyone in that public can access all of that data. Obviously we'll talk about access control as well, but um, all of those properties will be accessible even though if you're using them or not in your front end. So this is something we have to be a bit careful about. So we definitely need this line drawn between what we have on the back end and what we're sharing on the front end. And we normally do this using serializers, but in this case, we essentially define that in, within the, the GraphQL types over here. So once we have our basic model type configured, we will then um, create the query object. And um, over here, I've built, a, again, a very simple query object. And you can see that in this query object, I have subclass uh, a few objects here and one of them is the user query and the me query and this essentially links to the authentication part the authentication library i'm using so instead of me creating the user query i'm just using that from the library uh, and that's something we'll talk about in a bit as well um, but for the query itself all you have to define is the company's attribute and let it know that you're expecting a list of company type so that's what's going to be returned and when you resolve the companies, you simply select all the companies from the company model and return them. And everything else, the GraphQL, the Graphene library will uh, handle for you. So if I request just uh, one of the properties, just the name of the query, then it will know that it just needs to return the name from all the company objects. So, and I'll just add over here, uh, in, in this particular example, I've added the access control. So I'm, I'm looking at the uh, request context. And if the user is authenticated, then I return the, all the objects. Otherwise, I don't. And this is normally how you're managing um, access control within GraphQL. The final part that we need to build in order to have a full CRUD API available for our uh, well, in this case, it won't, it won't be a full CRUD, but in, in this case, we'll be able to create a company. Uh, and that is going to be this mutation. So create company mutation creates a company. That's pretty obvious. And within this, we first define the inputs. And then uh, in order to validate them, we define the arguments again so that it knows that, okay, this is what's going to be coming in the request because we obviously won't be sending the ID in, in the request itself. Um, and then the mutate function is what we override where we define all the business logic of how do we go about creating that uh, object. And of course you have a ton of logic over here in terms of uh, creating multiple models, editing stuff, updating stuff, deleting stuff, whatever you want. And this is essentially the core of your business implementation. In this case, obviously, we just created a company object. We saved it to the database, and that was it. And then we returned the, the graphene mutation again uh, with the information that we've just saved. Uh, finally, at the end, you will notice that there is a mutation class. So any mutation we create, we have to include it in this class. And then we use the query class, the mutation class, and all of the uh, object uh, the type classes we have, we re register them into a function and that effectively generates our schema automatically. And that's one of the 
strong parts of graphene, right? So we don't have to go around creating the schema. Uh, this will be automatically created for us when we uh, do, uh, when we run the code, essentially. So looking at the code on the previous screen, um, there you can immediately see that there are gonna be some issues that we're gonna run into almost immediately. Uh, the first and the biggest one is that there is no straightforward way of managing errors. Um, so if uh, over in the, in the previous slide, I'm obviously uh, raising an exception here uh, if the user is not authenticated, but how is this exception returned to the user that is not essentially defined very well. So I will get an error in my errors array, but it's not going to be uh, very useful because it's gonna be throwing in a lot of garbage in between as well that's related to GraphQL. So, so this is something that has to be ma handled manually. So that's something to keep in mind when you're building your own uh, GraphQL implementation. Um, the next thing uh, that I noticed was that there is gonna be a lot of boilerplate code if you're having similar mutations, right? Because this is this mutation over here is just for create company. Now, if I wanted to create a similar one for update company, you can imagine I'll be literally copy pasting this whole thing and then deriving it from there. Um, and then maybe for delete might have to do it again. So this essentially creates a lot of duplicated code. And again, the good thing about Python is that you can extend the classes. Uh, so you can have a base company class a mutation and then you can extend that to create the update and delete and create uh, mutations and whatnot. So uh, at the end of the day, it does come into play, but it's not something that comes out of the box. So this is some stuff that you have to do yourself in order to get this uh, nice and clean and tidy at the end of the day. Um, access control, uh, as you can see, I've added a, a check over here. Uh, this is obviously a very simple example, but if you had slightly more complex uh, access control rules, uh, you can imagine that if you ha try handling that in the mutate function, that's gonna get hairy really fast. So this is again, something that is not part of graphene itself, but something you have to figure out um, outside on your own. So uh, graphene, again, uh, it, we've seen how easy it is to get started and it looks pretty straightforward. It's pretty minimal. You don't have to do too much. You just create the types, the queries, the mutations, and you have your endpoints. You can start updating data. You can start querying data. And behind the scenes, your Django could be linked to anything you want. It could be linked to a SQLite database, a Postgres, an Elasticsearch. You don't have to worry about anything because essentially it all comes together. Uh, the graphene library makes sure it just calls the right Django ORM functions and then that actually fetches the data as, as, as needed. Um, that's it. Uh, it does have quite a few things missing and this is where um, things start getting a little bit tricky, especially uh, with things like no built-in file upload. Oh, you have to use an external library and uh, I was watching uh, this video, uh, I'll show that in a minute, and, uh, oh, and the guy was saying that it's not very well maintained. So when you run into these kind of bolt necks, that, that's when it becomes a little bit dangerous. Um, it also doesn't have the latest features of uh, GraphQL, things like the Apollo Federation support that came in over the last year. Um, so uh, this is actually available in, in the newer, uh, the other library that we're talking about. Um, so Graphene, again, has all of these uh, cool, simple, integrated fun functionality for Django, but at the end of the day, it is missing quite a lot of stuff that you have to go ahead and implement manually. So if you're looking for a um, project that's a live project, then uh, you'll find that it's not going to be that straightforward. So uh, I was talking about this project, and this is an excellent example to explore. Um, so Sailor is a company. Uh, they have this completely open source uh, implementation 
uh, on you based on Django and Graphene. And they have this talk where he talks about all the different challenges that they have had with uh, GraphQL and Graphene. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting because um, if you look at it, all of these issues are a little bit serious at some point. And it almost, it's, it's almost like you're trying to hack uh, the GraphQL implementation into, into Python. So uh, when, after, after reviewing the talk, I was a little bit skeptical of the whole implementation. And that was just because one thing that, that struck me with, with me was that Apollo server natively is in JavaScript. It runs in Node.js. So you will always be a little bit behind of what the latest, fun latest functionality in GraphQL is if you're using anything except for JavaScript. So I feel that because of its uh, native types, the way it's written, the way it's defined, the way the schema is defined, and then your whole front end being in JavaScript, uh, the JavaScript seems to be like the better choice for using GraphQL at this stage. However, uh, in the case of Sailor, and, and the reason I was exploring this as well is that when you have a large Django code base, you want to, instead of rewriting everything from scratch, you just want to reuse that on the fly. So, and that's why I started exploring this. And for, the, for those kind of apps, the, I think Graphene does a good enough job that you can just essentially create another layer of classes and mutations and queries on top of the code that you already have. And you can actually end up having a very uh, simple and solid implementation with some work uh, on there. Um, I will add, so one final big thing that I haven't really touched up to date was this whole fact that um, a lot of GraphQL parts, especially when it comes to uh, Django, the, the subscriptions, and the subscriptions in, in GraphQL, they are pretty cool. You can query a subscription, you can create a subscription, sorry, and then whenever that query updates, it will tell your client that the data is updated, right? So that obviously requires web sockets and asynchronous behavior. Um, now, if you talk about using Django with subscriptions, it does technically work, but uh, we all know that Django inherently was built for synchronous workflow. So um, everything in the pipeline from starting from whiskey to your quest, to your libraries, to your database handler, they need to be converted to async in order for it to work properly. So, uh, and it's, it's stuff like this that when you start looking at it from a, from a big picture, you, you start seeing that there are pretty big holes uh, when it comes to implementing uh, Django with GraphQL. That said, I mean, if you are pure Python, then the other uh, library, uh, Origione, is actually uh, has the everything. It has Apollo Federation. It is using Django channels uh, and uh, other async functionality to uh, create subscriptions and stuff. So it looks pretty cool as well. I, I did not get a chance to explore that, but uh, it's definitely much newer and doesn't have as good an integration with Django as Graphene has. So uh, if you would like to explore this as well, so I, I over the last few weeks I've been sitting around, I created this uh, GitHub repository where I've created a very basic starter, bringing all of this stuff that I've talked today into this repository. So you can essentially just uh, clone this and see how different things are placed and they're moving, how the different parts are moving. Um, the good part, it still remains. It's very minimal. So in, in the sense of you don't have to write too much code in order to get things working. So, but it's only when you start scaling upward do you start running the problems of things like the boilerplate that we talked about or different libraries and functionalities not being available where you have to include other stuff. Um, and that was uh, it uh, from my side. Um, I hope you, you all found this useful. And uh, if you guys have any questions around this, uh, I'll, I'll be happy to answer that. Uh, yeah, Mishud, so there are a couple of questions, I think, uh, on the chat. Perhaps I guess you can take a look at it. Yeah, I can see the question. All right, so... Um, so for the first question is, uh, GraphQL is a solely 
JSON based query? Does it offer complex queries like group by, et cetera, offered in SQL? So uh, like you just saw, the, the syntax essentially allows you to define uh, what you want. And then essentially you're calling a function and you implement the function on the other side. So uh, GraphQL itself does not essentially do any, write any queries for you or do anything that sort. It just helps you define the, the request. So on the other side, if, you, if your database supports uh, uh, group by or whatever, it, you can write that query and return the data in, in that format. So GraphQL just comes in between. Um, another question, the name graph doesn't mean and this library can only with graph. Yeah, exactly. So uh, this library is not only meant to be not only meant for graph database um, and that's this is just meant to be a middleware between your front end and back end so effectively it's a, it's a medium of communication and you can use it with any sort of database including in-memory databases right so we've seen our implementation with Django uh, effectively any uh, database that Django supports the model will link in and it will start returning that data uh, like it sees fit Cool. Any other questions or thoughts from anyone? Cool. I think that was it. Uh, thank you guys so much for uh, uh, hearing me out. And uh, I'm now going to hand it over to Junaid Pai to take up on our final talk for today and uh, share a little bit about open source and Python. Yeah, you can hear me. Okay. Okay, hello. Hopefully you guys can hear me. Yep, we can. Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, I think uh, my talk is about generally about learning any, any kind of technology by uh, interacting with the open source uh, projects and other stuff. So I'll be starting off a bit with my brief uh, introduction so uh, I think I am a software engineer at Security AI. Other than that, uh, overall, I have around more than nine years of uh, soft professional software development experience with four, more than four years of experience with Elasticsearch in particular. And uh, over the time, I have interacted with a number of different open source projects. Uh, and, uh, and also, like, I have been, I've done some occasional contribution to, uh, you can tell, Elasticsearch Curator module and some, some, some uh, other stuff as well. Uh, I'm, I'm, I won't say that I am, you can say, an active contributor, but you can call me as an occasional contributor. Uh, other than that, you will find me speaking at different uh, uh, even conferences, events as a technology speaker. So that's a bit about myself. So uh, the agenda for today is uh, we'll start with a brief description about uh, what is open source software all about and uh, what are the, what is the difference between the, an open source software and free software, are they same thing or they are a completely different thing? Other than that, uh, uh, there are a few misconceptions, few myths about OSS software and particularly uh, people are generally afraid when they are, uh, when they are creating an open source project that if they make their project, they make their source code public, how could they be able to generate revenue? How could they be able to earn money? So, so we'll try to address those as well. And a few, uh, you'll see a few reasons and purposes behind contributing to open source software, why that matters and what benefits do it provide for the contributor and how we can contribute to uh, open source uh, softwares, what are the general steps. And then at the end, I'll share a brief learning what I had learned uh, while collaborating and contributing with the Elastic Curator module. So uh, I'll begin with uh, this slide. 
So uh, there are a lot of different logos over here, uh, including uh, you can say different tools such as Elasticsearch, Kibana, uh, which uh, was seen by talk uh, in the beginning. Uh, and similarly, Mongo, it's another database. Uh, I think if, if you have been working with the different container technologies, uh, you would be knowing Kubernetes and Docker. Uh, and uh, most, of, most of the people have already, I, I believe, uh, uh, worked over Linux platforms. Uh, and similarly, SQL, Node.js, Angular. So, so the, these are a, a lot of different tools. Uh, and even there are also some programming languages such as Python at the top and Java and C, they, they, they all are actually uh, they've open source. They, they, uh, so they all belong to the open source family. And if you, can, if you want to take a look at their source code that is primarily available uh, in some form, either over GitHub or through some other mechanism, but the source code is generally available. And by the way, I would just like to, if, if you guys can raise your hand, if, uh, if you have worked over any, any of the tools mentioned over here. So that would be good if uh, there is an option of raising hand in Zoom calls, so that would be good. Yeah, I see, I see a number of different people raising their hands. So most of, most of most of us have already worked uh, in some way on uh, some sort of open source software package. So uh, we'll start then what is actually, what defines an open source software package? What are the characteristics of, you can say, an open source uh, software package? So the definitions that I took from the open source uh, uh, software foundations, and uh, it, it, it was, it is actually uh, an initiative that was started in back in 1998. And uh, uh, primarily you can say, uh, Linus Torvald was the man behind who was, uh, who, who actually laid the foundation of, you can say the, the entire open source movement with, with you can say with the, with the Linux operating system. And then uh, again, we have seen uh, this particular movement uh, gaining, you can say, a lot of momentum in, in the 2000s. And uh, you can say lately, uh, we, we do see that many of the companies have started, uh, you can say, uh, have started formulated their business plans based on the based on open source software. So uh, it's, it's primarily a software development methodology uh, through which actually uh, uh, harnesses the power of distributed peer reviews and also provides transparency uh, uh, in software. So uh, the overall outcome of these two things is that uh, the software which results is actually of a better quality. It doesn't have, uh, you can say, dependency or it isn't uh, have uh, it, it isn't restricted uh, or influenced by a few set of people. It is available for uh, general community. Whoever wants to work over it, it's, it's uh, particularly available for them. There is higher readability. Uh, again, uh, and anyone uh, who wants to see uh, what a particular application is doing, he can uh, go and actually traverse out the source code what is available. There is more flexibility. Uh, there is less cost involved and you can say one of the uh, problems that we have seen that it it actually ends uh, a vendor lock-in which we have seen uh, uh, again happening uh, uh, associated with some some particular vendors uh, earlier on so uh, there are actually few uh, uh, you can say a uh, few uh, misconceptions as well related to open source definitions that it doesn't only mean that you can access your code, you can also freely uh, redistribute the source code. And also you can uh, actually, uh, uh, you can actually extend out that particular, uh, any of the uh, open source uh, software and you can extend it out. But again, if you are extending it out, then again, uh, you, you need to fulfill and comply with the license of that particular open source software. Uh, also, uh, an open, if you are contributing to an open source 
uh, software, it it doesn't mean that your rights and your in, uh, and integrity of author will not be protected. It is protected, and uh, and wh whoever whoever the author is, whoever has contributed that particular source code, so the the you can say the 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 name and you can say integrity is preserved. And one more important characteristics of open source licenses are that they must be technology neutral. They, they shouldn't be associated and restricted by a particular technology. If you take a look at the open source ecosystem, so the entire open source software, it actually revolves around community. It revolves around the people, a group of people who can contribute and collaborate together in order to uh, generate one of the uh, software packages and libraries. As well, there are a few myths that uh, we consider that, okay, if a software is freely available, if a software is available as an open source package, it would be less secure because there isn't any, any company, any particular, you can say, uh, company behind it. Uh, it is a generally thought. But that's not true because uh, uh, we, we even we consider that open source software is more secure than some of the proprietary software because uh, it has more number of eyeballs going over it, more number of reviews, more number of people are, are reviewing the code. They are actually uh, collaborating over it and so uh, stuff like that. The other thing is open source is considered harder to maintain uh, because the responsibility doesn't lie with uh, a few set of people. Uh, you can't say that uh, a few people will be responsible for maintaining the entire code, but it's the community uh, which is responsible for maintaining it. Uh, so uh, the, the ecosystem has evolved over time. And now we see that, uh, again, there are many people who are actively contributing it. So the maintenance responsibility is distributed. And we find that uh, with, with the, with the number of uh, processes defined and with the number of, you can say, mechanisms in place, we find it open source uh, software as uh, more uh, readily maintainable as compared to the proprietary software. The, the other uh, concern is that there is less support available for open source software. Uh, you can say that uh, uh, the support is not uh, is not less available for open source software, but uh, you don't get it readily available. There isn't any SLA defined in order to get response from the open source community. But we have seen the model have, uh, the business models have evolved over time and we see different companies uh, actually uh, supporting and maintaining different open source packages and they have their uh, different subscription and licensing options in which they offer uh, uh, you can actually uh, get support by actually paying some some amount of money, and then uh, you 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 can get support in a predefined time for that particular software or project. Then also, it is considered that open source software is not enterprise grade. Uh, that's that's not true as well uh, because there are there are plethora of open source packages available. Some of them may not be enterprise grade, but again, if you look around, there there are there are plenty of open source packages which are of enterprise grade. Even if we take a look at uh, the, the logos which we saw earlier on, uh, in fact, all of them, all of those softwares are, are of high quality and are readily uh, available and deployed by many, many, uh, you can say, multi-million dollar companies uh, in production environment. The other misconception is if you are making your software open source, you cannot earn money. Uh, so the models will change. You will not be earning money by selling software, but uh, there are uh, other methods available through which you can uh, generate revenue for your businesses. The, those are primarily uh, based around uh, service-based uh, uh, models. So, uh, so you, you, you can generate uh, a pretty much large amount of money. Even in fact, we are seeing a trend where uh, a, a lot of companies have actually started moving to the open source uh, platforms and, and they have been actually generating, uh, they are quite big names. Uh, 
so this this is uh, this is one of the transition if we see in the software industry uh, earlier on uh, if we take a look at the era from 1980 to 2005 we have seen most of the software that was available that was available through some some sort of commercially available of the shelf products uh, you you may have uh, again many of the uh, windows products available then we have uh, uh, many different uh, kinds of softwares like the Office One, uh, Adobe Photoshop and, and other stuff. Uh, those are primarily available. You, you, you typically buy licenses for that particular software and then uh, that license would have been associated for a particular system. But over time, we have seen uh, uh, the transition to a SaaS based model where uh, again, software services were offered by companies uh, as, a, as a service and uh, again you can just uh, use those services through uh, those service those applications are deployed in cloud environments and then you can use it through some sort of uh, web portals and other stuff and now we are seeing uh, a transition as well to commercially open source software and by commercial open source software we mean those companies that rely on open source software for some, some sort of their uh, revenue generation and commercial activities. And Elastic is uh, one of those, one of the big companies that have been based on, uh, that have been operating on this particular model. And uh, they, they are generally uh, considered in top 50 uh, by OSS Capital. Uh, I think based on their, their uh, latest results, I think uh, the revenues were around somewhere around 400 million for the company. And so uh, moving to some of the core values which uh, open source software uh, ecosystem has. Uh, so the core values include collaborations. Uh, people must be collaborating together and there is transparency of code. Uh, you, 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 you can actually track out uh, from where the request was originated, why the request was originated, till the time when it went into, you can say, uh, it went into the release when the code was actually written and then when it was merged into the base branches. Uh, there is also the principle of uh, generosity and meritocracy that, uh, okay, if you are contributing quality code, uh, whoever is contributing quality code, uh, actually, uh, the software gets merged into base branch, irrespective of any kind of discrimination against uh, gender, race, uh, and, and so on. There is also innovations uh, around. So uh, again, you will see plenty of uh, innovation going in the open source uh, area. You won't find the the uh, the uh, you can say proprietary software to be innovating at that much higher pace uh, uh, at which an open source software is, uh, is actually moving on. So uh, we'll see why we need to contribute to uh, open source software. So just wanna see. So, if, if we, uh, one of the major reasons behind contributing to open source software is learning how to write high quality software. And by high quality, there, there are a number of different dimensions of quality. So one particular area is uh, quality in terms of functional correctness and in terms of performance, how well a software is performing when it comes to scale and how uh, well the software is performing with respect to different cases and uh, does the software able to address all of the cases. Uh, there are other aspects as well, other dimensions, which include software readability. Uh, is my software readable to, uh, to other as well or not? That's, that's uh, one dimension. Does my software uh, cases automatically uh, tested or automatic test suits developed for my software or not? And whether I have written a sufficient amount of documentation in order to assist users of my of my software that, uh, so so that there isn't any any difficulty uh, 
uh, they, they don't face any difficulty behind running that particular software. So, so those last three dimensions, those are the ones which uh, we tend to ignore when working in proprietary environments. And those are the three uh, areas which you can learn a lot when you are contributing to, to uh, open source software. There are other, uh, uh, the other reason is that you also gain to learn about the processes inside behind software development. So uh, each of the organization when we are working with, uh, we tend to have some software development processes defined for our organization and they are specific to our organization. And uh, we, we tend to, uh, we tend to actually, uh, not have any idea about what are the software development processes adopted in uh, other other parts of the world and in the, the other parts of uh, uh, other you can say areas of software development industry so uh, if you want to learn open source is uh, probably one of the best case through which you can uh, learn around uh, different you can say version control systems how uh, version control system is used in different scenarios and how we can actually uh, continuously, you can say, write code and get it quickly shipped it into production environment. So in order to do, do that, there are can CI, CD pipelines defined and if, uh, and Jenkins or Travis CI, they are perhaps, uh, perhaps they are probably used in order to integrate your source code uh, to run quickly the test cases to uh, to know uh, how what is the state of uh, the quality of your your project and then getting it quickly shipped into release. Also, you get to know about peer review processes, uh, and you get to when you are interacting with a number of different people, you get to know about what are the different review processes. So how how code is generally reviewed. Uh, uh, by different people. So you get to uh, work with, with different uh, peers and then understand their mindset, how they are reviewing your code and then automatic test execution, uh, how, how it can be done. So, so those are a few uh, areas and those aren't only the software development uh, processes uh, that, that one may have. There can be some uh, other aspects as well. The other aspect is giving back to the community. So that's one of the coolest aspects uh, that you are developing something for others, which other people are using. And you get to know quick feedback uh, that who, who is using and did they find any bugs or what is their experience. So again, you can get uh, quick feedback through it. And uh, I, I would just like to share one of the quotes by Adam Grant is that uh, uh, being a giver uh, may, may appear to you that it is not good uh, for a hundred yard run, but it's quite valuable in a marathon. So uh, if, if, if one develops a trait of being a, dev, a giver, a giver to community and in, in, in any of the forms, then uh, again, in the longer run, it gives, it produces valuable results, uh, both at the individual level and as well as the societal level. The other thing is you get a chance to build an awesome portfolio. You get peer recognition, you get community recognition, and then once you get recognitions, it actually uh, raises your prospects for getting better jobs and uh, again, working on maybe maybe a newer project getting involved with other people's uh, maybe working on a startup or some, some some other stuff so again there are there are better future job prospects for it the other thing you meet amazing people uh, you grow your network you find mentors as well uh, while you are collaborating so uh, that's that's uh, one of the uh, again an awesome benefit of collaborating with open source. Also, you can turn your ideas into reality. So again, we know that uh, a, a great project typically involves a large number of you know, the people contributing together. But 
uh, if you are working in a proprietary environment, uh, you won't be having uh, an access to large amount of funding. So in that particular case, again, if you have a great idea, what you can do, you can follow a three-step process. You uh, create an open source project for that particular idea, build a network of people around it, and then again, uh, by collaborating with those people, you can turn this idea into life and into reality. So a few things, how we can contribute to open source. So I think uh, this is, uh, I, I actually uh, was listening to one of the talks and I think I've mentioned that talk in uh, references section as well. So he gave, uh, he gave an idea of, he gave actually, there, there is a Maslow's hierarchy of need and he related that particular concept with the programming concept and particularly contributing in the open source environment. So we find out that uh, if, if I want to uh, learn to contribute in, uh, in an open source uh, environment, so that's, a, uh, that's a, there is a hierarchy of need. And uh, typically it comes to our mind that, uh, oh, okay, since I want to contribute only as a source, uh, I want to contribute to a particular project, I would only be needing uh, expertise in a particular programming language or a particular, uh, you can say, tool. But that's not the case. Uh, when you start collaborating with open source uh, software, you need to know uh, a few different things. And first, uh, the primary thing is knowing about GitHub workflow terminologies. And uh, by the way, if you are restricted to uh, collaborating over GitHub environment, then it, it would be related to GitHub workflow terminologies. If you are contributing to a uh, project which is hosted over any other, you can say platform, then you need to know workflow terminologies for that particular platform. But primarily most of the open source softwares, they have been hosted over uh, GitHub platform. So if, if, if you are able to learn about the terminologies on uh, GitHub platform, uh, I think that, that's, that's a good starting point. And then we have Markdown. So Markdown are, are, are specific tools which we'll be talking about uh, in the next few slides. So that comes after uh, getting some insights about GitHub workflow terminologies. And after Markdown, you need to know about uh, some, some working knowledge, how Git works. Uh, and once you know uh, how Git works and how you can actually uh, collaborate uh, on, on, on a Git, on a project based on Git, then perhaps comes the coding stage where you can actually code and then uh, you can uh, contribute it to that particular open source platform. So going ahead with the GitHub terminology. So there are a few different terminologies uh, when you start working with open source platform. One terminology is uh, knowing about the uh, repository, what is our repo all about? And once you know about the repositories, then you, then you can actually, uh, again, uh, it's, it's, it's simply, you can call it a directory of code, whatever uh, code is pushed uh, and uh, is available on, and whatever you can see over GitHub platform. So it, it, it is actually a repo. So it's simply, you can call it as a directory of code. Then commit, you can treat it as a point in time of code, what source code is available at a particular time of code, we call it as commit. And then uh, the branch, a branch is a particular version of committed code. So uh, you can see that uh, again, if, if, if you want to uh, uh, see what, uh, uh, if there's a, there, there can be numerous versions of uh, code at a particular time because since Git is distributed, so a large number of uh, code a large number of versions can be worked simultaneously at a particular time. Then we have master. And so you'll see uh, master is the default branch. 
and then we have pull requests. So when a particular version of code is ready to be merged into base branch, then we uh, we we generate pull request. And pull request is simply means of generating uh, uh, generating your changes and getting them merged in the base branch. And when you fork a repo, then you are actually creating a copy of repository in your uh, own GitHub account. So uh, this is this is uh, how you actually fork a repos and uh, you you get it. You 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 actually uh, create a local copy of you can say a repository to your local account, which is available uh, uh, in some kind of open source project. So uh, we talked uh, briefly about markdowns and markdown, you can call it, it is a lightweight markup languages. And primarily this is, this allows you to style your course uh, and by defining some, some sort of, you can say, uh, syntaxes and some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of, you can say, plain text formatting syntaxes through which you can style, style out your text, uh, which is available through documentation, through README uh, and other stuff. By default, uh, it, is the, it, it is the default language for README documentations for open source software. And uh, files uh, typically, these files typically end with .md or .markdown extensions. And you can find out uh, guidelines and details about uh, markdowns on on the link which is attached which is mentioned over here now coming to the intermediate uh, git so uh, typically how you work is that you take a clone of a project and uh, you create you take a, take a clone of that particular project project on your systems and then you work on those systems and whatever whatever work that you have been doing it uh, on it. So, so that particular work is actually available on your local system. And till till the time you haven't add you haven't added it, it is available in your local working directory. But when you add it uh, by a git add operation then that particular, those particular changes gets pushed to some sort of staging area. And that staging area is also maintained on your local system. And when you add those changes on your, uh, you can say, system, then you can commit it. And then once you have committed uh, those changes, those gets actually, um, uh, those gets added to your local repository. And once that uh, change is added to your local repository, you can push those changes and then it gets added to, to the remote repository of your forked branch. And then uh, once you have you are done with all the changes, then you can perhaps uh, go to your uh, GitHub account and then from your GitHub account, you can raise a pull request against the, the remote repository available uh, from, the, from the organization for which you, you want to contribute to. So uh, once you have contributed it, then it's all about uh, coding and it's all about what you want to code. And then again, uh, uh, so, so, so those are a few, 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 uh, few things, few, you can say prerequisites that are required before contributing to an open source project. So you can choose yeah. a project. And you, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. I think we'll just background noise. Okay, okay. So I think uh, I was just uh, mentioning then what you can do is that again, you can choose a project and the project can be chosen on the basis of your familiarity with the languages and different tools. Uh, you can search by a specific language of interest. So if for example, you are interested in Python, you can go to GitHub, you can search Python and you, you will get uh, the, act, the, the different projects which are available uh, on GitHub account for that particular language. You can also look uh, for projects based on the recent trends, which 
which are the projects which are actively being worked on and which are the popular ones so if you want to learn out some some of the technologies which are uh, which is which is quite popular in the community and uh, that that can perhaps increase your job prospects you can just visit uh, github and observe the trends uh, what are the trends so again press everything is all about code once you are familiar with it and then uh, you get familiar with the entire pipeline you you keep on contributing with the, uh, with the with that particular open source organization so uh, and it's not only specific to software that uh, you can uh, contribute uh, there are a number of different uh, other options as well so for example if if let's say you want a new feature to be added in elastic search and uh, perhaps there is some use case uh, that you faced recently for which support is not available in elastic search uh, project then uh, yeah, what you can do you can easily raise an issue uh, you can raise a feature request from there or if you find a bug in the software then perhaps you can just uh, report a bug over there as well and uh, you, you you can raise any any sort of issue and uh, the community is generally quite respectful and uh, so uh, even if you are a new you you are a new person to that particular project you don't have any idea you can uh, raise an issue and it's the best way of knowing about the project uh, you just uh, research a bit about it if there are any confusion or you see some behavior which is misleading you can uh, post out and uh, report problems and someone from the community will respond to it and those responses we see that uh, typically within a day uh, you will get response for that on your uh, query even if you find some uh, issues with documentation uh, i think you can uh, fix gaps in documentation uh, or if you see there is a need of uh, adding more stuff or 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 uh, whether you were installing a package and you found that uh, the documentation steps were not clear so you can perhaps uh, generate steps which are more easier to understand and uh, and and you can generate uh, an md file for that particular documentation and then those those will be eventually reviewed and merged into the source code and again uh, contributing in any any kind of software code you can contribute to as well so uh, we we saw uh, uh, we we discussed earlier a bit about markdowns so typical files which are uh, available so there is a readme file there is a license file there is a contributing file so readme file generally carries uh, instructions about how to build the project how to use it there is also a license file which deals with uh, what uh, under what license the open source project is released what are the terms and conditions if you are using if you are adding something to that particular project uh, and so 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 what are the conditions that apply to you uh, etc so before you are using any any kind of open source applications in uh, in in your project i think uh, you should always refer to the licensing part of it because uh, down the line i think if if there is if you are not complying with some of the legal parts of it then perhaps it can uh, raise it can actually create problems for you the other thing is contributing files here all the authors who have contributed are mentioned and uh, you can find if if you have contributed some stuff on that on on a particular project your name would also be mentioned here and that's that's a cool thing uh, to use uh, for uh, you can say uh, maybe getting recognition and and uh, other stuff so uh, i'll just pause over here and see whether we have any questions up till now uh, i don't mm. see any up till now in the chat okay yeah so feel free to post any questions you have up till now i think i'll proceed with uh, my experience with uh, with uh, contribution on the uh, with elastic uh, tools different tools 
And meanwhile, after the call, I'll uh, try to respond to the questions that you have. So uh, this is one of the feature requests. So uh, initially I had uh, a problem. I wanted to have, uh, we can say, a support. Uh, there, was, uh, there was a use case that I faced that I wanted to fetch uh, all the mapping types uh, that were conflicting for a particular uh, index pattern. So it's, there wasn't any support available for it. So uh, I, I just uh, asked a question randomly. And then from there, I came to know that there is one more feature available for it. Uh, though my exact question was, uh, my exact, uh, th this was somewhat related to my question. And by use, there was another API available that provided something similar to that. So uh, when I used that particular uh, API, it solved my problem. So this is one, one uh, such use case where you can create out issues uh, where you find any, any, any problems with a particular library or any thing missing with that particular library. You can raise uh, a feature request for it and then someone from the community uh, res responds back to your question. Also, I found that uh, inside uh, the documentations for Elastic, uh, I found that uh, there is a missing piece. So uh, uh, typically there are a number of queries which include uh, exist term and terms query. And this ignore malformed uh, option was also supported with terms queries as well. But those terms queries was not mentioned as a part of documentation. And when I was just going through the documentations, I found that, okay, perhaps that should be added. So I just raised uh, a pull request uh, uh, containing that particular uh, uh, terms query as well. And that was eventually merged in Elasticsearch documentation. So again, uh, uh, anything which is available as open source, the entire community has the responsibility. And if we find anything missing to it, I think uh, we should actively like uh, try to contribute uh, to it, be it uh, either on the documentation front or, or the code front or, or any, any functionality that we would like to add. Then I also had some uh, experience uh, collaborating on the uh, Python front on Elastic Curator module. So Elastic Curator is a module uh, that allows you to manage indices uh, in Elasticsearch clusters, and it is written in Python. So before ILM feature was available, uh, by the way, ILM stands for Index Lifecycle Management, uh, before ILM feature availability, Elastic Curator uh, was quite extensively used uh, after ILM availability. I think most of the stuff uh, is managed by Elasticsearch itself. If you have uh, ILM, uh, more ILM features enabled through XFact, you can actually uh, uh, get it done automatically by Elasticsearch cl uh, clusters itself. But before that, we, uh, we extensively used Elastic Curator and we wanted to have some 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 sort of uh, uh, new support, like for example, freezing and unfreezing indices. That's one of the options available in Elasticsearch. So for that, uh, I raised a pull request. And uh, if you want to go and see, uh, there is a reference for that particular pull request. I'll briefly go. Uh, what were my additional learning from contributing to the source code? Some of the learning was uh, general, uh, which, which we mentioned earlier, uh, what could be the purposes and reasons behind contributing to open source platform. But other than that, with respect to uh, Python contributions or uh, the software uh, or contributions with this particular uh, pull request, what I learned was I came to know about click library, which provides some cool mechanism of, uh, you can say, uh, passing command line programming options through Python decorators. And uh, you can add simply uh, simple decorators on uh, uh, classes and functions. And then uh, again, uh, uh, the command line 
uh, processing capabilities are automatically added to it. I also get to know about unit test framework. So Elastic Curator has an integrated Travis CI pipeline and through which uh, they used to test uh, the curator, the, the functional working of curator with different Elasticsearch versions as well as different Python versions. So all of them were done uh, in a seamless fashion and uh, for each commit uh, that was done. And after that, you, can, you get to know about whether, uh, whether uh, what was the status, whether some of the test cases were broken down or not. So, so those are a few aspects that I, I get to know about. The other important aspect is learning asynchronous means of communications and learning to be patient. So again, if, if you are, uh, if you have any query, again, the entire community works on asynchronous means of communication. So, so you create out issues, you post out comments, and then uh, you wait and you eventually get a response back from the community. So that's, that's uh, one of the ways in which open source community works. And uh, the typical proprietary environments, typically they more work on synchronous media means where, uh, where uh, people collaborate together and people schedule calls together. But in the open source world, uh, it happens that uh, you actually, uh, create, you actually uh, post your queries and then you wait to get your response back. So that was uh, one other aspect that, that I learned. By the way, this is just a snapshot of how Travis CI was integrated. Uh, and uh, I have just added a snapshot for my particular PR. So you can see that uh, for each run, you can see there was a version selected and there was a version selected for Elasticsearch and there was a version selected for Python. And the test was run for all of these combinations. And once all of the test cases are passing, uh, there is a tick mark added uh, to the pull request and that tick mark indicates that everything is working with this particular pull request. And uh, if there aren't any other uh, questions by the reviewer, it can be safely merged into the base branch. So yeah, that's it from my side. So uh, do you have any questions? Yeah, feel free to add it on the chat box. And you, you can also join our Facebook page, uh, which is uh, available and this is for the Elastic Tech Pakistan. We also have a Python Karachi Facebook page as well. So that was uh, pasted on the event link so you can also join that. So I'll wait here for the question. Yeah, I don't think there are any questions at this stage. Okay. I really like the zero four point three one and that is beautiful. Uh, yeah, that's true, Zainab. When you are contributing it, uh, you are also helping uh, someone, some other people, as well as you are also learning uh, at the same time. And you are also learning from people uh, from different geographies and uh, Again, you get to know a uh, mindset of different people, how they think, and uh, uh, again, it helps you to be detailed, oriented, and more thorough in your design. Okay, so I think uh, we are also, the time has also ended. So by the way, these videos will be available, I think in a couple of days, so, Uh, that will be available on the Elastic YouTube channel, so you can subscribe to those as well. We'll also paste link on the respective community channels as well. Awesome. Thank you, Janay. I think that was a very uh, interesting presentation. Um, cool. I think, guys, uh, that's about it for today. Uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed it and learned something new. And... Um, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me over to me or Janet or, 
over our communities or through our social media profiles. And uh, we will try scheduling these meetups uh, more regularly in the coming uh, weeks. Um, hopefully see you all again over there soon. Thank you all.